usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. <laughs> Debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, people talk unemployment close to an all time low. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that, that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working, um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old, it's never 100. I mean, there's always, you could be um, a homemaker, a, a student, um, they're, they're uh, retired, early retirees. There are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce, but not you know, taking 10% off or 14% decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's uh, so if you, if you throw those people into the, un, they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is a recession or a depression level, actually. Um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. I don't want to overuse metaphors, but one metaphor is you have a very beautiful, expensive vase and somebody knocks it over and it breaks into 5,000 pieces. You can't put the vase back together. You've got to go get a new one. And that's what's happened with the supply chain. The What I call supply chain 1.0 from 1989 to 2019 is broken. Uh, there will be a new supply chain. There always are. Supply chains have been around since the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the new supply chain, what I call supply chain 2.0, will look very different than the old supply chain. Right now, we're in an in-between period where things don't work well. Uh, again, it doesn't mean total chaos, but you know, you still see shortages, you still see higher prices, which are coming from supply chain disruptions. Um, and these things are not easy to fix, but they can be replaced. And that's what I expect to happen. We'll hear from them at some point, but we're in a recession now. And people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which, you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. Around November 2021, you'll recall there were headlines, you know, bare shelves, empty shelves, supply chain breakdown, you know, Christmas will be canceled, et cetera. And it was all true. You, you went to the supermarket. It didn't mean that every shelf was completely bare like, uh, you know, East Germany in the 1950s. But there were, you know, paper goods might not be there or maybe your favorite kind of tomato sauce or, or you know, chicken or whatever it was. There were some things there, but a lot of things weren't there. And that got worse. And then, of course, because of, uh, gas prices skyrocketed uh, because of um, uh, basically because of a lot of bad policy from, uh, from the United States in terms of Keystone Pipeline and a lot of other factors. That then, you know, got worse. It eased up a little bit in the summer, but it never went away. This is a complex system. It was breaking down. That was very. If we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and, you know, uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call. I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data. Uh, and it's a very, very troubling sign, less seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening 
And the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff, and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? But I found some really, really interesting research that because uh, everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it, make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want, we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S.-China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, <laughs> that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden, you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we started selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of L.A. to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships. Economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know, nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. Debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half, maybe that's continuing. Um, People talk unemployment close to an all-time low. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s, and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working. Um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old. It's never 100. I mean, there's always, you could be um, a homemaker, a, a student, um, they're, they're uh, retired, early retirees. There are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce, but not you know, taking 10% off or 14% decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's, uh, so if you, if you throw those people into the, un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is, a recession or a depression level, actually. Um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. I don't want to overuse metaphors, but one metaphor is you have a very beautiful, expensive vase and somebody knocks it over and it breaks into 5,000 pieces. You can't put the vase back together. You've got to go get a new one. And that's what's happened with the supply chain. The, what I call supply chain 1.0 from 1989 to 2019 is broken. Uh, there will be a new supply chain. There always are. Supply chains have been around since the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the new supply chain, what I call supply chain 2.0, will look very different than the old supply chain. Right now, we're in an in-between period where 
things don't work well. Uh, again, it doesn't mean total chaos, but you know you still see shortages, you still see higher prices, which are coming from supply chain disruptions. Um, and these things are not easy to fix, but they can be replaced, and that's what I expect to happen. We'll hear from them at some point, but we're in a recession now, and people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, it, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, get, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which, you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. Around November 2021, you'll recall there were headlines, you know, bare shelves, empty shelves, supply chain breakdown, you know, Christmas will be canceled, etc. And it was all true. You you went to the supermarket. It didn't mean that every shelf was completely bare like, uh, you know, East Germany in the 1950s. But there were, you know, paper goods might not be there or maybe your favorite kind of tomato sauce or, or you know, chicken or whatever it was. There were some things there, but a lot of things weren't there. And that got worse. And then, of course, uh, uh, gas prices skyrocketed uh, because of, um, uh, basically because of a lot of bad policy from, uh, from the United States in terms of Keystone Pipeline and, and a lot of other factors. That then... You you know, got worse. It eased up a little bit in the summer, but it never went away. This is a complex system. It was breaking down. That was very. The biggest single failure is taking everything for granted, assuming that whatever occurrences happen, whatever bailouts are, con are, are constructed, that the dollar itself will not be called into question. And there is no legal limit on the amount of dollars the Fed can print. There isn't. There used to be. As late as 1968, um, the Fed was required to keep 25% uh, in gold. Uh, by the Treasury has the gold, but there had to be that much gold around. So your your uh, your base money, your M0, could not be more than uh, four times the uh, the gold supply. And earlier, th that, that was even tighter. Um, but they abandoned it. This is at the time of the Vietnam War when Lyndon Johnson just wanted to print hey, the Great Society in the Vietnam War. So they took it away. Since then, there's been no limit on the Fed's ability to create base money. So when you say, oh, well, the, the bailouts keep getting bigger, and they do, and the, the money printing keeps getting bigger, and it does. But if there's no limit on that, why can't you keep doing it? And that's how the elites view it. They're like, yeah, we'll just print as much as we can. What's the problem? But there is a limit. It's a psychological limit. It's a um, behavioral limit. It, 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 you cross it what physicists call a critical threshold, where you, you you've gone through the looking glass. It's no it's no longer more the same with a bigger balance sheet. It's like you know what? I'm looking at your whole balance sheet. I don't like any of it. Get me out. Yeah. Now here's where people are. Everyday people are much more creative and much more adaptable than the regulators understand. There was a solution on the table that they never pursued because of cronyism. See, now we're getting into the gangster side of it, the, the cronyism side. So what they should have done by executive order and the legal authority was there, they could have nationalized all the big banks. Not permanently, because I'm not in favor of socialism, but temporarily nationalize them. The clean what you do is you wipe out the equity. You, first of all, you rip out the bad assets and you put them over here in trust for the American people. So we, it might take 20 years to sell them, but whenever we sell them, that money goes to you, the taxpayers. Over here, we now have a clean bank. Equity, you're wiped out. 
Bond holders, how big's the hole in the balance sheet? 20% haircut, 40% haircut, whatever it takes. Preferred stock, you're probably wiped out. Put the losses where they, where they should be. Put the losses on the people who deserve it, which are the stakeholders in the institution. Mm. So now you get rid of the bad assets, you wipe out the equity, you now IPO a clean bank to raise new equity, and you start over with Citibank and Goldman, all these guys private with new owners, and clean balance sheets, and we can get the economy moving again. Okay. That is not what happened. What did they do? They took the TARP money. By the way, TARP was the greatest bait and switch in history because Hank Paulson, our Secretary of the Treasury, went to the Congress and said, I want this money so I can buy the um, bad assets from the banks. I want to strip out the bad assets. It's not what he did. He took the money and gave it to the banks as capital, and they kept the bad assets, which meant that when they recovered, the bankers got the profits, not the people. So this was cronyism as first. Nobody went to jail. None of the big banks failed other you know, than Bear Stearns. But that's their starting place. They're like, what's the problem? We can print as much as we want, have as much debt as we want. They actually say debt is a favor to investors. The government doesn't need the debt. Just give us our instructions for Lockheed and we'll send them the money. Why do we have to issue bonds and then pay them? <laughs> Cut off the debt. Debt market is a favor to investors. That's actually what they say. Um, but what she's missing, what the advocates are missing, what the Congress is missing, what everybody's missing is that people will have a revulsion against the dollar. Well, there actually were wooden nickels in the 1930s. They, some, in a town, there was a severe shortage of money. The Fed completely screwed that up. Nobody wanted to borrow, nobody wanted to lend, they weren't creating any money. And there was a shortage of money. And some carpenter in town would take a dowel and slice it and make wooden rounds and they would stamp it you know it wasn't five bucks that was a fortune you know five cents or whatever it was a wooden nickel and that money circulated it was money money i think gold is a great form of money it doesn't have to be gold though it has to be whatever it is it has to be something that everyone has faith in if you have confidence that if you take it from me in exchange for goods and services and someone else will take it from you and that shared belief is sufficiently widespread it's money that's all it takes they're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. But I make the point that, yeah, despite the difficulties, we don't have to be victims. We're not helpless. We don't have to curl up in a ball. It, the, the key is to see it coming. If you can see things coming, you can deal with them accordingly. You can get through them, not only preserve wealth, but actually make money. I always uh, point out the example of um, Ugo Stinnes, and people go, well, who's that? Uh, he was an industrialist in Weimar, Germany in the, the uh, early 1920s, and he could see the hyperinflation coming long before the middle class, long before anybody else. He went out and borrowed an enormous amount of Reichsmark, so that, that was the currency at the time, and just bought industrial assets, coal mines, uh, vessels, uh, you know, natural resources, etc. So here comes the hyperinflation. He gives it a little time. He pays back his debts. I would say your pennies on the dollar, like a, a millionth of a penny on the dollar, in other words. Uh, but he paid it back. They were sweeping the money down the sewers, but he paid back his debts and kept all the assets. And he became the richest man in Germany. The Fed's not done. Uh, we're going to see um, at least one more interest rate hike. Um, maybe, but they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So, um, because they, and they, Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, end of November, a, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing. Inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not. They, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment's going to go up. Sorry about that. But we've got to get inflation under control. So this is uh, unprecedented. It's never been this high. It breaks the pattern of running it up in war and paying it down in peace. No one roots for war, but they happen. Um, and, uh, and it's worse than that because of 
modern monetary theory. People say, well, Bitcoin's not backed by anything, or the dollar's not backed by anything, or the euro's not backed by anything. And I say, yes, they are. They're all backed by the same thing, which is confidence. Right. If I think something's money, and you think it's money, and I tender it to you for goods and services, and you think you're confident you can give it to Francis for goods and services, and we have a large enough group, it's money. Right. It can be, we were kids, we did this with baseball cards and bottle caps, you know, so anything can be money if there's confidence. But confidence is fragile. It's easily lost. And when you lose it, it's very... You, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S., dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Um, and, and by the way, when I when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in a state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, that's not going to be the group. But, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market, such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for $50,000 in, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized, but there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, but. Uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, 
I know that disability has been a has seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And you, you, you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it's low is low. In other words, the, the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You, you say how many people are working. That's the, the, the numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others that are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I said, it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, uh, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's put, a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home, um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robin Hood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But, um, but a lot of people saved the money, but, but there was a very, there were def very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money. They'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um so there are la the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of 
uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are. As an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First of all, it's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Oh, where I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. You, you brought up... Um chapters one and two from from currency wars where you you basically highlight uh, this scenario um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that russia and china would accumulate large gold reserves pool their gold and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the u.s dollar is that the form it would take for you something backed by gold probably and here's why um and, and by the way when i when i wrote that and when we did the war game and when i wrote that russia had about 600 tons of gold and today they have 2300 tons china had about 600 tons of gold and today they have about 2000 tons just slightly less that we know of and they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque so russia and china did exactly what we warned the pentagon about in 2009 exactly which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more um so but uh everyone's like well the chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency no it's not going to be the group but, but but here's why uh well there are a lot of reasons but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for $50,000 in, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized but there are you know natural resources uh water you know, et cetera uh energy oil uh if you want to be in stocks okay get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources um you know, such as exxon Mobil, chevron i mean i'm not uh, i'm just giving these as an example but um the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself but uh 
um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a, uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been, a, has seen massive growth over the past, like, 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you listed a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the, the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the, the, the numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I said, several 170 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just. Who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's put, a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home, um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well, but, um, but a lot of people saved the money, but, but there was a very, there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money. They'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker, uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are late that, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll 
go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of, uh, how stressed businesses and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy, but, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you're if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are. As an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Oh, where I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. Now, there's another problem that's even scarier, and this is a central banker's worst nightmare. I talked about how the Fed is blundering because they're raising rates too high, too fast, etc., and they are. But the Fed has always said, we don't worry about inflation. We don't like it, but we know how to get rid of it. We just raise rates, and maybe they got to raise them longer and further than people expect, and maybe it's painful, there are costs involved, but they can kill inflation just by raising rates. They don't know how to stop deflation. I mean, how do you stop deflation? Can't raise rates. That'll make it worse. You can go to zero, but that doesn't. Once you're at zero, you're at zero. QE doesn't work, by the way. It's been tried to the tune of like nine trillion dollars, but the empirical evidence is that it's just, you know, they do QE by buying bonds from the banks, and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never goes to the economy. What good does that do? And the answer is, it doesn't do any good. So you can take rates to zero, but you're stuck. Could you have negative interest rates? In theory, yes, in Europe, Switzerland, and Japan did, but there's no evidence that it provided any stimulus. I mean, they did it, but it's like an experiment that didn't work. The problem with deflation is there's nothing a central bank can do, and it does feed on itself, and it does get worse, and that is a central banker's worst nightmare. However, quick footnote, we did see this in the 1930s, well, between 1929 and 1933, during the first phase of the Great Depression, it was the Hoover administration, then Franklin Roosevelt came in in 1933. And Roosevelt faced exactly the same problem. I mean, he shut every bank in America on like a second or third day in office by executive order. He closed every bank in America. Can you imagine President of the United States today? I don't care if it's, you know, Biden or Trump or anybody else, Democrat or Republican, issuing an order saying, Every bank is closed as of now. We'll get back to you when they're going to reopen. And that's what FDR did uh, to break the banking panic. But he still had the deflation problem. And the Fed couldn't do anything. I talked to Ben Bernanke about this personally because Bernanke wrote a book on this. And I read the book and I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, I said, here's what I think you said. Did I get this right? He said, yeah, that's it. You understand it correctly. But the Fed couldn't and didn't do anything. So how did FDR break the back of deflation when the central banks were powerless? The answer is he raised the price of gold. He devalued the dollar against gold and raised the price of gold 75% from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. And that worked because it wasn't about rewarding holders of gold. In fact, he had confiscated all the gold beforehand, so it was like insider trading. But the idea of raising the price of gold was really to devalue the dollar so you could get the price of corn, wheat, steel, oil, get the price of everything else up. And it worked. In the middle of the Great Depression, from 1933 to 1936, the market boomed. I mean, the economy did very well, but it was starting from such a low level, it was still depressed, but it did much better. You know, the Democratic theme song was Happy Days Are Here Again. Then in 1937, the Fed screwed it up again and caused a second recession in the Great Depression. And that's why they call it the Great Depression. But the devaluation of the dollar against gold worked. 
Nothing the central bank could do would work. Deflation is very troubling, and should be, to central bankers, economists, and everyday citizens, everyday Americans, because it raises real interest rates really steeply. It feeds on itself, and there's nothing central banks can do about it. And the only thing that has ever worked is devaluing the dollar against gold. So uh, that's one reason to have gold. But we're looking at a global recession. And those are rare, as I said before. Uh, it's one thing if Germany has a recession or Japan or the US, but usually there's another economy or economic group that's doing okay or at least better and can kind of pull everybody out of the rut. But global recessions where everybody is declining are rare and that's what's happening. And that's what we had in 2008. So the US is heading for one. We've just talked about that at length. Japan's in a recession, Europe's in a recession. China's in a recession, India's, you know, having some tough times. And a lot of this is dollar related. All the other countries I mentioned, Switzerland, India, China, Japan, have all seen their US dollar reserves go down. And everyone's like, oh, they hate the dollar. They're dumping the dollar. No, it's the opposite. They don't have enough dollars. So they're selling treasuries to get dollars to bail out their own banks because there's a dollar shortage. So the fact that you see those dollar reserves coming down does not mean that they hate the dollar. It means that they need dollars, that they're short of dollars, and they're so desperate that they are selling treasury securities to get dollars to bail out their own banking systems. So we're well on the way to a global recession. Um, and if you say, well, you, know, you got communism, uh, socialism, uh, capitalism, uh, all these different economic systems, all part of this globalized system, how could they all be on the same wavelength at the same time? Well, the common thread is the dollar. It's the U.S. dollar. You know, about 60% of global reserves, 80% of global payments. It's the benchmark for every other currency. So when you talk about the euro, you're quoting dollars. You're saying it's a dollar five or dollar four. Gold, you know, you say, well, it's $1,800 an ounce, whatever. The point being, even when you're talking about a commodity or currency that's not a dollar per se, you reference it in dollars. Same with oil, world markets, all dollar oriented. So the dollar is the thread that runs through the whole global system. And it's a partial explanation for why everything's falling apart at once. What's the optimal asset allocation method? Well, the key is diversification. And when you say diversification, people roll their eyes and go, oh, of course, everybody knows that diversification is good and all that. But the problem is they don't understand what diversification is. And I run into people all the time and they go, Jim, I'm highly diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, mines and minerals, you know, consumer and durables. So I'm highly diversified. And I say, no, you're not. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class, which is stocks. And they're all going to go down together or go up together as the case may be. But particularly in times of stress, they become highly correlated. So having 50 different stocks or ETFs or whatever is not diversification. It's just having a whole bunch of bets in one asset class. So what does real diversification look like? Well, you should have some, you know, 10 year treasury notes, or if they're a little too volatile for your taste, look at a five year note or a two year note that will basically give you very, uh, you know, the credit secure, I'm not doubting the credit of the United States, but that will give you a deflationary hedge. If we get into disinflation and deflation where interest rates are coming down, which I do expect, you're going to get very good capital gains on those notes, or you're going to be very happy with the coupon in the meantime. Real estate, uh, definitely. Uh, not so much commercial real estate, too soon for that, but multifamily housing, residential real estate, farms, other kinds of income producing real estate for a slice. Good slice of cash, maybe as much as 30%. People hate cash. They go, ah, I don't get a yield on cash. You know, cash is a waste of my time, etc. Um, it's true that it has very low yield, but number one, it performs very well in deflation, which we talked about. But more importantly, um, cash is the opposite of leverage. It reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So if you have volatile investments in the wings, Cash is a, you know, it's like a bar connected to two ends of the barbell. It has very low volatility, but most importantly, it gives you optionality. If you see stock markets crashing and burning the way I expect, the way I described, the person with cash can go out and go shopping in the ruins. And by the way, Warren Buffett has, Berkshire Hathaway has over $130 billion in cash. Why does 
Buffett have so much cash? Well, he sees what I see. We're looking at the same thing, which is a kind of meltdown where the person with cash can basically go shopping for bargains. Definitely a slice of gold for the reasons we talked about. That'll be your inflation hedge. But 10%, you know, people always say, you know, Jim Rickers will sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't think that's a good idea. But 10%, yes, that's a good slice. You know, private equity, if you can have access to good deals, that's a separate category. And so, so a model portfolio, you'd have a slice of treasury notes, a slice of cash. I have some stocks, but I would focus on, uh, for example, energy, you know, BP, Exxon, uh, Mobile, Shell, Marathon, uh, this green new scam thing, forget it. It's a big deal, I mean, from a policy point of view, but it's infeasible. I've studied the science very closely. It's, it's going to go away. But in the meantime, if you bash the oil and natural gas companies, but you're going to need the oil and natural gas, which we do, then those stocks are going to do well. Real estate, I mentioned, uh, and, and gold. So that would be a really diverse portfolio that would have five or six different asset classes. And some will outperform others. You know, some will do better in inflation, some will do better in disinflation. But that's the whole idea with this much uncertainty. Uh, and your winners, your winners, pardon me, winners will outnumber your losers. And cash is like a thermostat. You know, you can reduce cash and buy a little more gold or reduce cash and buy a few more stocks if that's warranted. So that's what a, I think an ideal portfolio is. The future is very positive for gold. Uh, you have the normal vectors, you know, uh, supply is flat has been for six years. Demand is going up. Central banks have flipped from net sellers to net buyers. That's a big deal. Um, and the retail institutional interest is higher. So that's good. Geopolitical threats. Don't need to say a lot, you know, from the U.S. perspective, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, you name it. So that's the vector. But the biggest driver right now is what I referred to a few minutes ago, negative real rates. Because gold, as a form of money, which is how I view it, competes with other interest rate, competes with other instruments, treasury bills, et cetera. Well, if they have high yields and gold has no yield, you want the treasury bills. But if uh, if interest rates have negative yields and gold's just flat, gold looks more attractive. So that's the main driver, and that's going to continue. Everyone's like, well, you know, the gold is up, gold is down. Uh, but when, the, when so what do you mean when you say that? And they're talking about the dollar price of gold. And it's like, okay, so the dollar price of gold is up or down. That's really a cross rate. That's so different than talking about the euro, US dollar exchange rate or, or Australian dollar, US dollar exchange rate. If you think of gold as money, and I do, then the dollar price of gold with gold measured by weight, not as another currency, uh, it is another form of money, but with gold measured by weight, it's a cross exchange rate. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight because when someone says gold's really going up. I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more, and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. And so when you say gold is going up, let's say it went to $2,000 an ounce. It was, oh, the price of gold went up, you know, just went up uh, 10%. Um, well, did it or did the dollar go down? Uh, the way I would phrase it is, you know, it used to be $1,800 to get an ounce of gold. Now it's $2,000 to get an ounce of gold or, you know, your dollar got you one eighteen hundredth of an ounce. Today, it only gets you one two thousandth of an ounce. Uh, in other words, gold didn't do anything. It's a metal. It's an element, atomic number 79. What happened was the, the dollar got stronger. So a stronger dollar is a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar is a higher dollar price for gold. So when people talk about gold going up, what they're really talking about is the dollar going down.
we have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. Now, now China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons, US was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, was a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one. Literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons well you know the market you, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month not not one country in one order but they had it all along but they decided to reveal it put it on their balance sheet so uh americans don't seem to like gold i'm not sure canadians feel much differently or others around the world uh but central banks sure do and i think that tells you something there's huge demand for dollars all over the world not because of the currency but because of collateral because of treasury bills Banks need treasury bills to pledge as collateral for derivatives. It's the best collateral in the world. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to leverage your balance sheet as much as you would like. You're not going to be as profitable. You're not going to be able to support lending and investing, which is what banks in theory are supposed to do. So to, to support the bloat of balance sheets and to support the derivatives, you need collateral. And the better the collateral, the more leverage you can have. The best collateral in the world is a treasury bill. And so there's a mad scramble for treasury bills, which means there's a mad scramble for dollars to buy treasury bills. And that is coming from European banks, it's coming from Chinese banks um, and banks around the world, but primarily European and Chinese. And that's not going away. So it's, it's, it's funny to hear people, or people think it's funny to hear anyone talk about a dollar collateral shortage, like, hey, haven't you flooded the world with dollars? Hasn't the Fed printed $9 trillion? And the answer is they have. But that's not the measure. It's, it's, a, it's a high multiple of that. It's the dollar value of all the collateral. Because in the repo markets, you know, I pledge the collateral to you, and then you pledge it to somebody else, one of our colleagues, and then she pledges it to somebody else, et cetera. That collateral gets pledged 50 times and supports not one dollar a balance sheet but fifty dollars a balance sheet for a dollar of collateral and so you restrict the collateral you're restricting the balance sheet the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight but as a payment currency there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency anything can be a payment currency if i want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that then it's a it's a currency so all of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. I can give you 20 reasons why the dollar should go down, but I'll give you one big reason why it won't, which is the demand for collateral. And so that's keeping the dollar constant, which is keeping the dollar price of gold constant because gold doesn't change and the dollar's not changing. Now that'll break um, and that'll break in favor of gold, meaning the dollar will get a lot weaker. It'll have to, but it's going to take a few months at least because the U.S. economy has to get weaker, which it is. The Fed will figure this out maybe by September, ne next September. Um, and uh, then they'll ease a little bit and they'll try to weaken the dollar to try to give the U.S. economy a boost, but we're not there yet. So it's going to be, now that doesn't mean the price of gold is going down a lot. I'm just saying it's not going to go up a lot. It's going to chug along kind of sideways, but when it breaks, it's going to break big to the upside because the dollar is going to go to the downside, but that's probably at least um, still a few months away, maybe longer.
Just at a very high level, um, I would say that there are a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges. We'll talk about all of them in detail. You know, people put words in your mouth and kind of get the reputation as this doom and gloom guy. You know, Jim Vickers is always talking about the end of the world, which I don't. I never talk, use, use that expression. But I make the point that, yeah, despite the difficulties, we don't have to be victims. We're not helpless. We don't have to curl up in a ball. It, the, the key is to see it coming. If you can see things coming, you can deal with them accordingly. You can get through them, not only preserve wealth, but actually make money. I always uh, point out the example of um, Ugo Stinnes. And people go, well, who's that? Uh, he was an industrialist in Weimar, Germany in the early 1920s. And he could see the hyperinflation coming long before the middle class, long before anybody else. He went out and borrowed an enormous amount of Reichsmarks. So that, that was the currency at the time. And and just bought industrial assets, coal mines, uh, vessels, you know, natural resources, etc. So here comes the hyperinflation. He gives it a little time. He pays back his debts. I would say your pennies on the dollar, like a millionth of a penny on the dollar, in other words. Uh, but he paid it back. They were sweeping the money down the sewers, but he paid back his debts and kept all the assets. And he became the richest man in Germany. And my German is not very good, but his nickname was the Inflationskönig, which means the inflation king. So there are other stories like it, Joseph Kennedy in the 1929 crash. But here's a guy who lived through the greatest hyperinflation of any modern industrial economy and ended up as the richest man in Germany because he saw it coming and made the right move. So again, we're not helpless. We can do things about it. But the key to empowerment, as I say, is to see it coming. That's where the analysis comes in. And you're like, um, gee, you know, Jim, are you smarter than everybody else? Of course not. Uh, there are a lot of big brains around, but um, people have flawed models. There's a lot of um, behavioral psychology behind it. You know, the you know, confirmation bias or believing the future will resemble the past, which it usually does not. And uh, so if you're going to stick to those models, yeah, you're going to get really bad results. It's hard to think of an institution that has a worse forecasting record than the uh, Federal Reserve, or the U.S. Federal Reserve, with the possible exception of the IMF. They're both pretty bad. I mean, you could almost take the Fed forecast, do the opposite, and, and be just fine. There's more to it than that, but they just stick to these really bad models. But if you understand how the economy really works, if you understand it's a complex dynamic system, all I've done is I've taken complexity theory, which has been around for a while. I mean, you can say 13 billion years because the Big Bang was uh, you know, the ultimate complex dynamic uh, paradigm shift or a uh, phase transition. But the science of complexity uh, understood in mathematical terms really dates to the kind of the early 60s. But it's been used very successfully in uh, physics. Um, it has a lot of applications. All I did was bring it over to capital markets. I looked at capital markets and said, wait a second, here's the, here's one of the most uh, complex dynamic systems you can picture. And then there's nothing more complex than the human brain. So you're putting humans on top of capital markets. You've got complexity squared or some exponent. Um, and those models work brilliantly. But try getting anyone to understand it or, or do that work is difficult. But But again, the point is, if you have the right models, and I would include behavioral psychology, a good dose of history, complexity theory, and a few other branches of applied mathematics, you can get very good results. But if you stick to, you know, the Phillips curve and non-accelerating inflation, unemployment rate, and uh, a lot of other nonsense the Fed uses, yeah, you're going to you're going to get it wrong. Um, does the the future resemble the past? with some probability, some degree of distribution of probability. Not always. I mean, and maybe less frequently now than ever. And they also assume that prices move continuously. You know, prices go up and down, of course. But uh, markets don't move continuously. Or if they do, it's when you don't care. When you do care, they just gap. They gap, gap down or they gap up. You miss it. You blink. And it's at a completely different level. It's been repriced. Now, you can still get in and out, but you've either made a lot of money or lost a lot of money you know, in the blink of an eye. So when you take those characteristics, and this is how I started kind of, you know, deconstructing it, if you will, and said, well, look, markets are not efficient. That's nonsense. They don't move continuously and slowly. They gap up and they gap down. And if you're not ready for that, you've missed the boat. Um, nothing's risk-free. So why don't we start there? When I started identifying those factors that, in my view, were incorrectly applied, um, and you say, well, what, what looks like that? Well, the answer is a complex dynamic system, you know, a system that produces hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning bolts and power outages and earthquakes and tsunamis. Those are all examples of the results of complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. It just 
you know, it just <laughs> the ground falls out from under you instantly. And that's what happens in markets. So then I said, well, maybe that's a better model. Of course, it, it, it is. Things evolve all the time. You, you uh, Another tool, intellectual tool, applied mathematical tool, I use is Bayes theorem without getting too much in the weeds. Uh, and I learned Bayes theorem at CIA because uh, I always say, if, if you have all the facts, a smart high school kid can solve the problem. The intelligence agencies and others, and people in capital markets, have to solve problems when you don't have all the facts. But you have no choice in, in national security or defense. It's, it's literally life or death. On Wall Street, it could be, uh, you know, your fortune or your client's uh, fortune. So you don't have the luxury of just throwing up your hands and say, well, I'm going to wait till I get more facts. Uh, that's what Janet Yellen did, but uh, that doesn't work in the, in the, in the real world. She's kind of detached from that. So how do you solve problems? When you don't have all the facts you need to really solve the problem and you know it, but you have, but you have to deal with it anyway, because it's, it's coming at you. Well, Bayes theorem says, um, assign an initial probability, a, a priori assumption. Just not make it up, but do the best you can, recognizing that you're going to fall short, that you've got missing pieces in the puzzle, if you want to put it that way. And if you have no facts at all, and it's a binary outcome. Give it 50-50. Like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's not quite 50-50, but red or black on a roulette table, it's, you know, it's a little less than 50-50. It was close enough. He says, it's either going to be red or black. Don't know which. I'm going to give it a 50-50. And then what you do, this is what statisticians hate. You update it based on subsequent facts. As new facts come in, you put them back in the model, you update it, and what you'll discover is that your probability either goes up or down. Well, if it goes down more than, you know, a certain amount, you discard it. You say, well, that's wrong. I just do it again. But if it goes up, what you're doing is making it more and more likely that your assumption was true. And so eventually you can get up to the 80, 90% level. Now that's not 100%, but it's pretty darn good. But there's, there's a tension, which is okay. As you're updating, uh, and this is something that was explained to me by Henry Kissinger. So imagine a simple graph and the, you know, the, the vertical axis, the y axis is, uh, the probability of a certain outcome and the x axis is a timeline. Basically the, you convert that into the amount of information you have. How much information do I have? How much time do I have to make a decision? What well, at zero, at the outset, you have no information or very little. But you have a lot of time. You have a lot of degrees of freedom. But as you move across the x-axis, as you move down the timeline, what you discover is you get more and more information, which is a good thing. So that curve is going up. But you have less and less time, fewer degrees of freedom. That curve is going down. So when you get all the way to the other end, it's like, hey, I have perfect information, but it's too late. It's over. I, I, I miss either a you know, war started or I lost all my money or something bad happened. So what you look for is the sweet spot in the middle, call it the Kissinger cross, where... I have enough information to be smart, but enough time to have degrees of freedom and be able to act. You look for that sweet spot in the middle, and that's when you act. And, you know, you, with a little humility is, is a very good uh, a tool, a good addition to the they, uh, you know, uh, nine trillion dollars of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as extra reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. There is we've been talking about recession, inflation, deflation, but the one thing we haven't spoken about yet, and you kind of just referred to it, is there a global liquidity crisis coming? And a liquidity financial crisis is different from a recession. Sometimes you can have one without the other. Um, and, uh, you know, 1990, we had a recession. There was no crisis. 1998, we had a crisis. There was no recession. The economy was fine in 1998, but the, the financial world almost came to an end. Uh, sometimes they come together, and that's what happened in 2008. We may be looking at a scenario like that. By the way, $65 trillion in foreign currency derivatives, yeah. But try one quadrillion in total derivatives. I mean, that's, that's foreign currency. That was the focus of the BIS paper. But when you get into interest rate swaps and uh, commodity swaps and, and swaptions and all the rest, that's one quadrillion, which for people not familiar with the Q word, is a thousand trillion. So wow. you point to 65 trillion, and you're right, that's FX, but there's a thousand trillion or one quadrillion of derivatives off balance sheet of the banking system, supported by collateral, a little sliver of collateral, and there's a dollar shortage, and that's getting ready to implode. Well, a couple things you can do. One thing, I would increase my cash allocation. Um, a lot of people hate cash. They're like, eh, it doesn't have any yield. Uh, why would I do that? I'm missing out on whatever, Bitcoin or stocks or whatever. Um, 
cash is extremely valuable. Number one, it performs very well in disinflation and deflation. Deflation, it could be your, even with a very low nominal yield, it, it could have a much higher real yield in the world when prices are going down. So it's a good deflation hedge. But more importantly, uh, cash gives you optionality. If taking everything we just described about a potential stock market crash that could be 30% or more, a global liquidity crisis that could be worse in 2008. I mean, there are plenty of signs of both of those things. Well, if you're the one with cash, first of all, you're not going to lose money on cash. Uh, you will on stocks and other asset classes, but not cash. And then when this uh, drawdown comes, when this collapse comes, you're the one who can go shopping. You can go out in the wreckage and say, oh, well, here's a good company. It's down 90%. I'll buy some of that. By the way, uh, the person with the most cash in the world is Warren Buffett. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway has over $130 billion of cash. Now, why do they have that? The answer is he see, Buffett sees the same thing I see, the same thing we're talking about right now, which is in a highly uncertain world with a lot of vulnerabilities, and that's exactly what we're describing, that come home to roost, and that's how I see 2023. Cash will preserve wealth and then give you the opportunity to pick up bargains. Um, I'd also have a slice of gold. Uh, I recommend 10%. People people always want to put words in your mouth. And get, Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't think it's a good strategy. 10%, yes. Now, if you have 10%, sit tight. Uh, it'll serve you well. If you don't, you might want to get some uh, some gold because a lot of what we're talking about is going to play out in foreign exchange markets. In crypto, there's nothing there. But they've replicated this infrastructure. And so a lot of the wealth that's been generated in crypto is because uh, you own uh, a crypto exchange or you own uh, a lender set. Now that's all imploding. It's it's kind of a replay of 2008, except a set of you know uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and you know Morgan Stanley was hanging by a thread. It's uh, uh, you know uh, well FTX most prominently, but it Genesis is is kind of considering bankruptcy, etc. So all that is collapsing. So Bitcoin's not an exchange, it's not part of that infrastructure, it's just a coin. Uh, my, the, the best analogy I've been able to come up with, that I have a lot more to say about it coming out of communications theory, but it's like a casino chip. If I walk into a casino, put my money on the roulette table, and the croupier gives me uh, chips, I can gamble them, I can play with them, I can make money or lose money. But when I leave, I go to the cashier and get my dollars back and walk out. If I take the chips outside the casino, they're worthless. I can't, I can't pay for dinner with casino chips. So cryptocurrencies are casino chips. You're in the crypto casino. Some people made a lot of money, and I, I know some of them personally. A lot of people have lost a lot of money. More have lost than made money, which is how casinos work, by the way. Um, so eventually, they'll all go to zero, uh, but you know, in stages. But what, what's collapsing right now is the infrastructure. China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything. But Switzerland's down a thousand tons. The U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one. Literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on the balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world. Uh, but central banks sure do, and I think that tells you something. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. If you think it can be a payment currency, if I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the, the uh, 
uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. The thing is, people don't understand reserve currency. It's not, it's not as if the People's Bank of China has pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement. Reserve currency means a currency of denomination of securities. So the key to, so what China does have are treasury bills and treasury notes. So the key to being reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. Do you have a large, safe, liquid bond market? And if you do, then people will, have, will buy those bonds. What else are they going to do with the money? But that's, that's much harder to replicate. Well, they can't have a currency backed by gold, at least not the Chinese yuan, because the problem is there is no Chinese yuan bond market of any size, number one. Number two, they have no rule of law. I mean, no, I wouldn't trust the Chinese or the Russians for that matter. Uh, and the U.S., the problem with the U.S. is that we had a good thing going. I've always said the world will not destroy the dollar. The United States will destroy the dollar through our own policy blunders. And when you freeze the assets of the Central Bank of Russia, I don't want to debate the war in Ukraine, that's a big subject, but when, when we freeze the assets of the Central Bank in Russia, and you're the Central Bank of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, China, you're like, hey, how do I know that next week the U.S. isn't going to not like something I did? Are they going to freeze my assets? So little by little, yeah, at the margin, you get out of the Silicon Valley Bank was taken over by the regulators on March 10th, but you can see it coming, you know, it was in distress, there was 40 billion dollars 40 billion pulled out of that bank in one day on thursday march 9th the day before it was taken over 40 billion just you know hit the road just just left it was a, it was a complete collapse and then you get all the corruption um you know insiders selling stock before the crash mary daly the chief regulator president of the federal reserve bank in new york she's running around uh doing uh with the elemental p plus and pride flag and all this stuff fine that's you know it's a free country you can do that if you like but she wasn't running the bank and she knows nothing about risk management she's a labor economist protege of janet yellen came up the ranks but knows nothing about risk management or actually running a bank so it, it just got worse and then, then here comes credit Suisse, right The entity is always different, the currency is always different, but the dynamics are very much the same. And the one thing I can say um, to our viewers is that this is not over. Um, there's been a little bit of a sigh of relief, stock market rallied uh, a little bit toward the end of uh, uh, beginning of April. Um, you know, and okay, that's that's a normal reaction, but any, any thought that the problem's been solved, the bailout's complete, you're not going to hear more, is just not true. Uh, there's more coming, get ready for it. I'm just saying that there are more dominoes waiting to fall. As you may have noticed, as we're going into a recession, and um, I suspect unemployment's gonna scream. I see more people here in Arizona standing on street corners and all this saying, you know, veteran, please give me a buck or something like this. And I just can't believe they're wasting their time begging for money. You know, this, this guy was a pretty young guy standing on the corner begging. And it's, it's not good. Um, so we're heading back, I think, into the 1920s. Very good chance we're going to be having, we're in the middle of a drought right now. This is a 90 year cycle in bad weather. The really interesting part about this, and again, we can come back to the specifics, is that the dominoes falling is a good metaphor. It's, you know, you, if you knock, you got 100 dominoes, you knock the first one, they're all going to fall. That's just physics. Um, so how do you stop that? How do you stop that crisis? Well, you, you truncate, you drop a steel wall between two dominoes and this one hits the wall and this one's still standing but that's the bailout but um the problem is each crisis tends to get to get bigger than the one before which means each bailout gets bigger than the one before my question that i'm wrestling with are we now at the point where the need of bailout is bigger than the capacity of the central banks today everything is changing so rapidly but this this time the the tom tom beats are getting louder and louder and more do it now exactly. basically my concern today is a real for kim and i our real issue is social unrest you know the gap between the rich and poor is now excessive and um, that leads to revolution civil rioting and all this when you print all this fake money and you rig it for the rich only what that produces is a wave of intensified and widespread social unrest, disjointed political upheaval, 
dangerous extremism, punishing trade wars, and sweeping isolation. The crash we see is in the commercial business sector. Again, the higher interest rates go, the more money people have to pay on their loans, particularly if they're variable, which by the way, just happened up in Canada. They got a lot of variable interest rates up there and they just raised the interest rate there 50 basis points. So we believe we're forecasting the big downturn is going to happen in 2023. It takes time for this stuff to take, you know, take hold. But then don't worry about it because when 2024 comes, they're going to lower interest rates in the United States in time for the presidential reality show. The most important thing today are credible sources. And now the alarm is getting louder as technology changes. We have to go to a solution pretty quickly because people are on suicide watch right now. <laughs> so. Well, first of all, everybody can do something, but they won't. And that's the problem. The reason, you know, who stole my pension? There was plenty of money in it, but nobody did anything. They just stole it. The people did nothing. It's like I said, the, um, when the crash came in 2008, not one of those guys went to jail. They got paid bonuses. So there's something rotten inside America. And I think the problem with many Americans is they're complacent. They expect, well, it'll, it'll heal itself again. The higher these interest rates go, all the people with adjustable rate mortgages, all the businesses that borrow money, that have variable rate mortgages, the governments that are deep in debt now paying more because interest rates are going up. So yeah, the equities are going to go up, but this economy is going to keep going down and it's going to go down big and it's going to go down hard. Not right away, but it's going to progressively get worse and worse and worse. UK traders now expect the BOE's next rate rise to be its last in the cycle. And in the Eurozone, markets expect rates to peak at 3.25% in the summer, up from the current level of 2.5%. 2.5% when you're looking at inflation rates in the UK and the EU that are killing the people. These, these interest rates are nothing compared to inflation. So when you put the inflation numbers compared to the interest rates, the interest rates are still deep in negative territory. It will prop up the equity markets, but the economies are going to go down. The question I ask people is, if we go into a depression, how will it be? That's the question. So I set it up since 1971 when I saw Nixon take the dollar off the gold standard, and I started getting smarter. So I'd say, I don't trust my government. Like, don't fight the Fed. And I was like, can the, can the Fed print oil? Can it print gold? Can it print water? Can it print food? No. But people go, oh, don't fight the Fed. So the thing I always say is, in a worst case scenario, how will you do? So that's why I own oil wells, not oil stocks. I own cattle for the food. I own gold mines. I own my own company. My company, you know, Rich Dad did better in the downturn ever before. So it's not recession proof, but people wake up more and they say, I better get financially educated. And I never stop studying. You know, it's, it's the most important thing you can do. Problem with Americans is we're dysfunctionally optimistic. You know, we live in a don't worry, be happy world. And you know, that's not the real world. So now we're dangerously close to the point where in, as the crisis gets worse, it's no longer, oh, gee, let's wait for the Fed to bail it out or let's wait for the ECB to bail it out. You get to the point, I think we're there, where you say, no, these guys actually can't stop it. And you lose, you lose confidence in the currency itself. The crisis is the dollar itself, and there's no way to bail out a dollar crisis. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are that they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. The 
Now, now China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons, US was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month. Their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world. Uh, but central banks sure do, and I think that tells you something. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is going to come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major U.S. recession in 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's going to be worse than they think. And then they wrap up the printing press again, Jim. Yes, but it doesn't work. You know, uh, $9 trillion of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as extra reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested. You know, do you have? Uh, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone says gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say the gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. In 1914, when World War I started, all the major powers went off the gold standard. They said, we've got to keep our gold. This is real money, and this is how we're going to win the war. And the Bank of England was faced, uh, and the Exchequer was faced with the same choice. Keynes was an advisor to the Exchequer. He said, don't go off the gold standard. Stay on the gold standard. And the reason was that if you did that, you would preserve your reputation and preserve your credit. He said, the, the war is not going to be won with money or gold. It's going to be won with credit. But if you stay on the gold standard, you'll have the credit. And that's exactly what happened. Pierpont Morgan, or sorry, Jack Morgan, uh, Pierpont's son, uh, organized huge loans for England and France and nothing for Germany. And England won the war. So the point is, Keynes got that right. Now, flash forward, 
1925, he's talking to Churchill, and Churchill wants to go back to the gold standard, and Keynes is telling him, you got the price wrong. You know, we can't go back at, you know, four pounds, 25, or whatever the exact rate was. Um, we've got to devalue the sterling by half because we doubled the money supply to fight the war. Churchill ignored Keynes' advice, and, um, and they went into a recession, depression, before the rest of the world. Flash forward 1944, you're at Bretton Woods. Keynes wanted a gold standard. And this isn't speculation. He wrote papers. He gave formal presentations. So 1914 is pro-gold. 1925, he's telling Churchill, you're nuts. You can't go back to a gold standard at this price. 1944, he's pro-gold again. I call that a pragmatist. Inflation, yeah, prices go up. So we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money. Same thing. But inflation, has, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. And we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. U.S. really started, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, etc. So that's coming from the supply side. The other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s and it just spun out of control and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side. Some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported. So fuel is part of everything. It gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are, other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and, uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. If we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and, you know, uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call. I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data. Uh, and it's a very, very troubling sign, less seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? But I found some really, really interesting research that because uh, everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it, make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want, we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S.-China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well. That's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil, all of a sudden you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now 
But now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships. Economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened, and for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last okay. January. Debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half, maybe that's continuing. Um, People talk unemployment close to an all-time low. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s, and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working. Um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old. It's never 100. I mean, there's always you could be um, a homemaker, a, a student. Um, they're they're uh, retired, early retirees. There are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce, but not you know taking 10 percent off or 14 percent decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's uh, so. If you if you throw those people into the un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10 percent, which is a recession or a depression level, actually. Um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. I don't want to overuse metaphors, but one metaphor is you have a very beautiful, expensive vase and somebody knocks it over and it breaks into 5,000 pieces. You can't put the vase back together. You've got to go get a new one. And that's what's happened with the supply chain. The, what I call supply chain 1.0 from 1989 to 2019 is broken. Uh, there will be a new supply chain. There always are. Supply chains have been around since the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the new supply chain, what I call supply chain 2.0, will look very different than the old supply chain. Right now, we're in an in-between period where things don't work well. Uh, again, it doesn't mean total chaos, but you know, you still see shortages. You still see higher prices, which are coming from supply chain disruptions. Um, and these things are not easy to fix, but they can be replaced. And that's what I expect to happen. We'll hear from them at some point, but we're in a recession now. And people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, get, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which you know don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. Around November 2021, you'll recall there were headlines, you know, bare shelves, empty shelves, supply chain breakdown, you know, Christmas will be canceled, et cetera. 
and it was all true. You you went to the supermarket. It didn't mean that every shelf was completely bare, like uh, you know East Germany in the 1950s. But there, you know, paper goods might not be there, or maybe your favorite kind of tomato sauce, or or you know chicken, or whatever it was. There were some things there, but a lot of things weren't there, and that got worse. And then, of course, because uh, uh, gas prices skyrocketed uh, because of um, uh, basically because of a lot of bad policy from uh, from the United States in terms of Keystone Pipeline and a lot of other factors. That then. You you know, got worse. It eased up a little bit in the summer, but it never went away. This is a complex system. It was breaking down. That was very inflation. Uh, nominally, yeah, prices are going up. Okay, so that's inflation. But it can come from two sources that are opposite. One is from uh, supply side shocks, supply chain disruption. We saw that in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo over the Arab-Israeli war. At the time, the price of oil quadrupled, etc. That was a supply shock. The thing about supply side inflation is it's self-negating. It burns itself out. So, you know, the old uh, saying, and it's true, the, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, when things get too expensive because of supply disruption, people can't afford them, businesses close, you get layoffs, you go into recession, and prices come down pretty quickly after that. The other source of inflation is from the demand side. And this is a completely different dynamic. We saw this in the late 70s, where um, uh, you know prices are going up, but people have some bargaining power. So unions are on strike. They're getting higher wages. Um, you know, I worked at Citibank in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. So the supply side disruption tends to snuff itself out. The demand side inflation tends to feed on itself. It gets out of control. And then we saw what Paul Volcker did with interest rates in 1980, 1981, where he took them to 20%. He, he caused a recession in terms of tight monetary policy to snuff out the inflation. But otherwise, if you don't do that, that just runs away. Now, this, the inflation we saw in 2022, late 2021, 2022, it was real. It wasn't transitory the way Jay Powell said. So the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. But they're expecting a mild recession. And I see a much more severe recession based on, based on a lot of factors, some of which we, we've spoken about. Now, the other half of your question, which is you know important to listeners, is what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. So the Fed story kind of goes like this. The, the Fed, uh, you know, forecasting what the Fed's going to do is the easiest thing I do. It's because it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm smarter than anyone else. The Fed actually tells you. All you have to do is listen and believe them. Now, a lot of people don't listen or they listen like, oh, the Fed will never do that. They, they will. They actually mean it. Starting in June uh, 2022, that was the peak and this inflation has been coming down. Now, it's still too high. The Fed's not done. Uh, we're going to see um, at least one more interest rate hike. Um, maybe, But they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So um, because they and they Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, the end of November, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing, inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not. They, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment is going to go up. Sorry about that, but we've got to get inflation under control. So is inflation here? Absolutely. It's in Australia, it's in the United States, Europe, you see it all over the world, actually. Um, even Japan, which has uh, suffered from deflation more often than not, is seeing inflation of about 4%. That may sound low to an American or an Australian, but that's sky high to the Japanese. So they're feeling the price shock as well. So it's real and it's here. It means that you know, you, you may not like the price, but you have no choice. You've got to go to work, take the kids to school, deliver goods, use your truck and your job, whatever it is, you have to do it. You have to pay that higher price. 
but it means that 75 extra dollars at the pump maybe twice a week so 150 dollars a week that's 150 dollars you don't have to spend on something else could be concert tickets, a show, a dinner, a new dress, um, a new suit of clothes, um, whatever it might be, you're, you're not going to buy that because you've just spent that much money um, on the gasoline. Well, that means all those other industries suffer. Uh, retailers have lost sales, restaurants have empty tables, uh, concerts have empty seats and so forth across uh, the entire spectrum of, of goods and services. Well, soon enough that results in layoffs, um, some business failures, um, price cuts, et cetera. And that disinflationary and deflationary trend ends up in a recession. So this is uh, unprecedented. It's never been this high. It breaks the pattern of running it up in war and paying it down in peace. No one roots for war, but they happen. Um, and, uh, and it's worse than that because of modern monetary theory. People say, well, Bitcoin's not backed by anything, or the dollar's not backed by anything, or the euro's not backed by anything. And I say, yes, they are. They're all backed by the same thing, which is confidence. Right. If I think something's money, and you think it's money, and I tender it to you for goods and services, and you think you're confident you can give it to Francis for goods and services, and we have a large enough group, it's money. Right. It can be, we were kids, we did this with baseball cards and bottle caps, you know? So anything can be money if there's confidence. but. Confidence is fragile, it's easily lost, and when you lose it, it's very, very difficult to regain. So how do you survive that? Uh, what's the optimal asset allocation method? Well, the key is diversification. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class, which is stocks. And they're all gonna go down together or go up together as the case may be, but particularly in times of stress, they become highly correlated. So having 50 different stocks or ETFs or whatever is not diversification, it's just, having a whole bunch of bets in one asset class. So what does real diversification look like? Well, you should have some, you know, 10 year treasury notes, or if they're a little too volatile for your taste, look at a five year note or a two year note. Real estate, uh, definitely. Uh, not so much commercial real estate, too soon for that, but multifamily housing, residential real estate, farms, good slice of cash, maybe as much as 30%. People hate cash, they go, ah, I don't get a yield on cash, you know, cash is a waste of my time, etc. Cash is, is the opposite of leverage. It reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So if you have volatile, volatile investments in the wings, cash is a, a, you know, it's like a bar connecting to two ends of the barbell. Uh, it has very low volatility, but most importantly, it gives you optionality. The answer is diversification. Everyone goes, oh, we, we know that, you know, diversification. but. They know the term, but they actually don't know what diversification is. And I'll give you an example. I run into people all the time. They go, well, Jim, I'm fully diversified. I have 50 stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, metals and mining. And I go, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks or equities. And they're all going to go up together or they're all going to go down together. And the more stressful the condition, the more reason you have to be concerned about it, the higher the correlation. You know, on any given day, some stocks go up and some stocks go down. But when you dial the stress meter up, they all tend to move together. You, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S., dollar is that the form it would take for you something backed by gold probably and here's why um and, and by the way when i when i wrote that and when we did the war game and when i wrote that russia had about 600 tons of gold and today they have 2300 tons china had about 600 tons of gold and today they have about 2000 tons just slightly less that we know of and they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is gonna be the global reserve currency. No, and it's not gonna be the ruble, but, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. 
In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very illiquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for $50,000 in, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized, but there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, but. Uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's, what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a, uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, it's seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever, but what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it Low is low. In other words, the, the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say, how many people are working? That's the, the, the numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I said, several hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just. Who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, 
there were a lot of people who stayed home obviously during COVID and just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit you know it's put, a good habit I think for the most part but it's like any habit once you break it it's hard to go back so once you get used to not working or working from home or you know we're just staying home um, the government was handing out checks you know beginning with Trump in uh, I believe it was June 2020 everybody got a uh, that one was a $1,400 check and then in December 2020 at the end of the Trump administration everybody got a $600 check and Biden comes in in February 2021 not to be outdone he hands out uh, I think a $1,600 check um, so everybody got a check like two or three of them and uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robin Hood and started trading Bitcoin that didn't work out too well but um, but a lot of people saved the money but but there was a very there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks well that's not surprising i give people free money they'll go buy stuff and that kind of kept the economy going it wasn't a real boom but it yeah it it, it um it looked good but we're not doing that anymore there's no more checks uh and so you had a lot of people lost the habit a lot of people staying home watching you know maybe uh the, the world series or whatever eating doritos but they're not working uh and um uh you know a lot of people out of the habit but they just got used to government handouts not everybody but but some and um the other problem is uh you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there are help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um so there are late that and people call this a labor shortage there isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million you know people between the ages of 25 54 who are sitting home but the problem from the employer's point of view there's a shortage of willing workers not, willing workers yeah not workers but willing workers well what makes you willing to work well a, a raise <laughs> a good pay is, is one you know as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and they're, big, layoffs, they're big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if, you, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's, that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First of all, it's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Oh, well, where I went to school, curves weren't flat, but that's, uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. You, you brought up, um, chapters one and two from from currency wars where you you basically highlight uh, this scenario um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that russia and china would accumulate large gold reserves pool their gold and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the u.s dollar is that the form it would take for you something backed by gold probably and here's why um and, and by the way when i when i wrote that when we did the war game and when i wrote that russia had about 600 tons of gold and today they have 2300 tons china had about 600 tons of gold and today they have about 2000 tons just slightly less that we know of and they may have several thousand tons 
off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but uh, everyone was like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, and it's not going to be the group. Of, but, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no when issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market, such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the rupee will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the rupee aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for 50000 in the, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized, but there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as ExxonMobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, but. Uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's, what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a, uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, it's seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever, but what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the, the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the, the, the numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles. 
enter the workforce, and then that number went up. So, it, like I said, it's never 100, but 70 was very strong. 62 is is down a lot. I mean, that's um, about a 14 percent decline. Um, look, you know, GDP. The standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus you know government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink and less productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's put, a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home, um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well, but, um, but a lot of people save the money, but but there was a very there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money; they'll go buy stuff, and that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it yeah it 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 um it looked good. But we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks, uh, and so you got a lot of people who lost the habit. A lot of people staying home, watching you know maybe. Uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, cause people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying, uh, $35,000 for an entry level, like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker, uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are late, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. In other words, employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say, if, you, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's, that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, where I went to school, curves weren't flat, but that's, uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators.